everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Vitul, if it's your first time watching. In today's video, I'm gonna record part two of how doctors are made in Canada and the US. If you haven't watched part one, I'm gonna leave it in the description box down below, so please check it out after this one or even before. So today's video is part two. I'm very, very honored to have Dr. Bazaki with me. He's an emergency physician and one of the clinical faculty members at my medical school. And um, it's very nice having you here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very, very pleased and honored to be here. Thank you so much for being part of this video and raising awareness about how doctors are made. Um, I received so many messages about that and it would be great like, to share that with us uh, in the next few minutes. So I would like to start just of how you know the clinical practice is applicable in the first two years of medical school. Me personally, when I came and to the school, I thought it's only going to be attending lectures or like studying from the textbooks. But we have a course called essential clinical skills, where we get trained with doctors about clinical skills that really matter for our future uh, role as doctors. So can you just tell us more about? why we have to start with such skills in first year. Sure. Well, traditionally, medical school has consisted of after, in the United States anyway, after four years of undergraduate school, mm -hmm. um, one can then go on to medical school, and the first two years classically have been academic work followed by two years of clinical work, or yeah. clerkships as we call them. We have found, however, though, that the sooner that the student finds themselves in the clinical environment, the better they are able to take the knowledge that they're getting of the basic sciences and have a framework on which to hang them in their mind. So many medical schools, including ours, are now starting to introduce the students to the clinical environment as early as possible. But to do so, we need to give them some skills to bring with them. And one of the things I love about teaching clinical skills is this is where basic science and clinical medicine start to come together. This is really many of the particulars of your craft as a clinician. Uh, because you can learn all about the heart and the valves and all the different sounds that the heart makes and all the different diseases that can happen. But when it comes down to it, we need to be able to interview a patient, you need to be able to listen to the stethoscope, you need to be able to examine them, and then look at all the EKGs and chest x-rays test results to find out in a live patient what is happening with the heart mm -hmm. and to apply all that basic science. So the great thing about doing that is as soon as possible, the student then has a context on which to hang the knowledge that they're given. That's great, that's great. Like we're just getting jumped right into the deep water, but basically that's gonna help us in the, in the long term, right? And is that something really like recently introduced into medical schools or that's something that been all, all the years, like, you know, forever. Well, the, the teaching of physical exam skills has traditionally been uh, reasonably early, probably, um, certainly in, in the second year. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, 100 years ago, uh, not so much. 100, 100, 150 years ago, medical school, at least in the United States, was uh, a one-year series of lectures that you attended twice in a row. Mm -hmm. And then once you had done that, um, you were then given uh, some kind of a diploma and you were sent to uh, basically be an apprentice with a physician who would then decide when you were able to go practice on your own. And that was in the 19th century or so that that was still going on. I want to say the tuition at University of Michigan at that time was around a dollar and fifty cents a term. Um, right. They've raised rates since that time and they formalized um, a four-year program now. So. The teaching of essential clinical skills is actually becoming earlier and earlier, as well as the introduction to the clinical environment is now become very early. Yeah. Because we found that if we offer that to the students earlier, all of those basic science elements and concepts tend to have a frame to hang on that makes a lot more sense and they're better retained. And I'm pretty sure there's like lots of research done on how effective those like courses to be introduced early on. Um, in the first two years of medical school and how effective they're gonna make doctors um, like in the third and fourth year, right? Well, having, having exposure to the clinical environment does make sense when we look at adult learning theory exactly. because when we look at how adults learn, there are a couple of things that distinguish them from how children learn, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, they, when adults come into the learning environment, and obviously medical students are all adults, 
um, they bring a couple of things. One, they bring in already having some experiences in their world, but they want to have some kind of way to bring that into context. And adults tend to want to have some kind of a frame to hang it on. Why am I learning this? How can I use this particular piece of knowledge to do whatever it is I need to do? And in this case, the practice of clinical medicine. And the introduction to clinical skills in the clinical environment early on really helps to support those two elements of adult learning. We, we love to like use logical patterns and like fit things sometimes in certain criteria just to know when the physician, like when the patient comes in, what's the first thing to do? Like applying or, you know, translating the sciences that we're learning into clinical things that would really be helpful and I, I really like it, like it so far. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And well, and there's a lot more to medicine than just simple retainment of a large amount of facts. Sure. There's a lot of knowledge to have, mm -hmm. but physicians think about disease in a very particular way, and teaching the students how a physician thinks is a very important part of that training. Exactly, like I always, whenever I go to a doctor, I'm, when I was a little girl, like I always wonder how they know, like what kind of disease is it? But when, once now I'm in medical school, I know it's a process, it's like, you know, skills that they learn step by step, and Although it's a huge thing because you're dealing with the human body, but there's science behind it, there's skills yes. that can be applicable. So this is really great. Let's now talk about the, the skills that we learn in first year. Um, so basically, if no one of you guys know in the first, you know, like every, with every block, we have maybe like two months of learning content focused around one system. So we learn something about the reproductive system and then the cardiology and pulmonary system. And now we are in the renal endocrine. And let's just, like, I want to just go back. We were just done with cardiology, but I want to go back and, like, touch base upon some of the skills we learned, um, Dr. Pazaki, in that um, block, which are, like, the heart sounds and, like, the lung sounds and how we listen to them. If you could tell them, like, a little bit about that, hopefully we'll go to um, Harvey, our friend, that you're going to see in a minute, and apply some, some of the skills that we learned. So with the cardiopulmonary exam, we're looking at both the heart and the lungs. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to only do one or the other since they're both inside the, the thorax, inside the chest cavity. Mm -hmm. So some of the things are the obvious things that a lot of people think of, like listening to the heart with a stethoscope. What parts of the chest do you listen to? What are you listening for? What do certain abnormalities sound like? What does normal sound like? That's incredibly important. Because yeah. if you don't have a sense of the range of what normal looks like, it's hard to pick up abnormal. And finding deviations from normal that can indicate disease is part of the whole thinking process in medicine. Of course. But there's lots more to the cardiopulmonary exam besides what we call auscultation or listening mm -hmm. uh, with the stethoscope. There is also examination and inspection looking for veins that are pulsating at rates and or to degrees that they maybe would not otherwise in the neck. Um, you can also look for how fast the patient's breathing. Mm -hmm. You, there's also what we call palpation, looking for pulses, which most folks are familiar with. Yeah. And there's pulses that can be palpated throughout the body. And we're going to look at some of those at RV. Um, so every single sign matter. A pulse, like a sound, just physical, like physically looking at like the chest and see if there's any bruises or changes in color, right? Every, everything matter. And that's what we learned. Right. And looking for swelling, for exactly. example. Some kinds of swelling can happen in heart failure mm -hmm. or various other conditions. Yes. And so what we do is we take all those findings and try to piece them together like a puzzle to see if we can then figure out what's causing the findings. That's great. Harvey is what we call a task trainer. He is a, a mechanism that is designed to simulate a human. And Harvey has some very specific functions. Um, Harvey is designed to teach the palpation of pulses in the upper extremity and in the neck, as well as auscultation of the heart. Okay. So S1 and S2 is what we're hearing, right? And there are two phases, systole when the heart is contracting, diastole when it relaxes. Exactly. Right? And systole happens in between love and dumb, or between S1 and S2. Mm -hmm. Okay? One, two, one, two, exactly. one, two. And this is why musicians often make great doctors exactly. because they understand these musical rhythms quite well. Now, let's see if we can get Harvey to show us 
what a problem with the aortic valve called stenosis sounds like, where the valve is a little tight and there's some extra turbulence. Great, that's, that's, that's right. All right, let's hear how that sounds. It's very different. Yes, so now we hear that turbulence as the blood is trying to push through an aortic valve which is stiffened and doesn't let the blood flow through as readily as it would in the normal case. Now if the aorta is, um, is leaking, then we get a slightly different sound. So let's hear what that sounds like. That's now that's made. called aortic regurgitation. This is when the aortic valve is leaking. So when you get the natural closure that should be happening after while well, the heart is refilling, if there's some flowing of blood back through the aortic valve, this is called the aortic regurgitation. This happens during diastole when the heart is supposed to be relaxing and filling. Normally, the aortic valve closes nice and tight shut, allowing the allowing the filling of the ventricle. But in this case, there's some leak. So you hear love whoosh, love do whoosh, love do whoosh. And this is basically what we learn about like you that students can come and get trained throughout the week and like you know we have exams that we need to pass. It's like we need to take it seriously along with our lectures. Just so when we finish those two years and go to the hospital, we're just ready to like interact with doctors and like if they ask us to do something, we kind of know we have an idea of how to do it. Well the thing about medicine is there are a lot of facts floating around. And there's so much to know. A lot of medicine is pattern recognition. And so what a trainer like Harvey allows us to do is to present the students with various types of heart murmur type sounds so they can start to learn to recognize patterns. What an aortic stenosis sounds like. How does that sound different than a mitral stenosis? How does an aortic regurgitation sound different than a mitral regurgitation? What part of the chest is it most well heard in? Does it radiate to the neck or not? And they can get those patterns down through practice and that, increase that their ability. Great. Yes, and increase their ability to recognize patterns, and then start that learning curve going, so that when they get into the clinical world, seeing patients with heart murmurs, which we try to get them there as soon as possible, like we talked about, they already have jump started their pattern recognition. Uh, another question after maybe we listen to heartbeat is there like is that something people wonder about like is there places or like suites for us to go and like practice with patients or we only like practice with mannequins well you can <laughs> certainly practice we have task trainers that are designed as um, ways that we can practice our exam mm -hmm. skills, especially finding abnormal findings. Exactly. But one of the things that's great about this medical school and about a lot of medical schools is we have a call, what is called a standardized patient program, where we have folks who are very well trained to come in um, to the medical school and you can interview them and perform physical exams, listen to their heart, listen to their lungs, and they can actually even give you feedback on if your stethoscope was in the right place or how your history went, all that type of thing. And then this can be also reviewed by your professors to help you accelerate your learning for your exam. We have like a checklist that the patient has access to and this is like just help us to further emphasize whatever we're learning on Harvey yeah. and like other stuff. Do I go to the suite and start them? We sure okay. can. All right, so we're now in the suite where we come and see patients, standardized patients. I'm just going to bring my checklist here for um, some of you guys to see. It's not like necessary that you see exactly what's in there, but we have to bring similar checklists. And this is, this is like a, in a way to standardize the process, right? Yes. So what this does is it pulls back the curtain, so to speak. So the student can see when a physician is examining a patient and they're doing all the steps that they can think of. Here's the list of all the stuff that goes through our head. Like any other form of simulation, and standardized patients are a form of simulation, I like to think of it as an educational accelerant. It is really important to form proper habits, like with anything else. And so the part of the point of the checklist is not necessarily to memorize the words on the list, but to give you a guideline so that you can develop solid clinical exam habits. Because once we develop a habit of exam, whether it's examining the patient, whether it's looking at an imaging study or looking at an EKG or lab results or whatever it may be, once we have a systematic way of doing this, 
then we can rely on that habit and free up the space in our prefrontal cortex and that conscious complex thinking mind to pick up abnormalities and think through what the next steps are in the process of thought. Yeah, so maybe we can just go over briefly what we do here. The room is designed to duplicate the environment of the ambulatory care setting or the doctor's office. Mm -hmm. And it has all of the elements that you typically would see. Because again, this is a form of simulation preparing for practice. You often hear about how pilots go on qualifying simulators before they actually fly the actual airplane. It's the same idea. So your doctors are taught their physical exam skills and their history taking skills in a simulated environment before then they go and do these things independently with real patients. So you'll see a lot of the same elements. These type of examination tables are precisely the type you'll see in the ambulatory environment. There are gloves as we commonly would see because a lot of times folks do wear gloves when they do physical exams. There are the tools of the for physical exam such as the otoscope used to examine the ears, the fundoscope or ophthalmoscope to look at the retina of the eye, right? all the little um, other accoutrements such as the little tips that go on the otoscope to look in the ear, blood pressure cuff, um, and so on, as well as the other equipment that we normally see, reflex hammers and, and so on. As you will notice, these little cameras up there, these are audio and visual recorded so that the students can review their own experiences with the simulated patient mm -hmm. as well as have peer review and by the other students to get feedback and review by their professors and what this does is it helps to accelerate the process of learning any kind of skill if you want to learn how to perfect any kind of skill whether it's your golf swing or your tennis swing or your physical exam skills whatever it may be if you're recorded doing it and then go back and look at the recording you can then see what it looks like and you can make adjustments accordingly. Because without having a third point of reference to record, the one person who can improve who you're doing is the only person who can't see it, and that's you. And this gets around that. So that's one of the reasons why this type of simulation is a very, very powerful tool for developing skills. You've heard me talk about simulation as an educational accelerant. That comes from the idea that, so that Socrates had, that education is a flame to be kindled, not a vessel to be filled. And so I like to think of simulation as the accelerant you can put on to make that flame burn brighter a lot sooner. And the types of exams you're going to do, the types of history you're going to take, mm -hmm. are correlating with the organ systems that are being covered in your basic science work so that it all flows together. This is what gives me the motivation every day to go back and like watch the lectures, interact with my faculty member because this is like science happening and applicable to like human beings which is just this connection that maybe is like sometimes trivial to, to make but it's just very important as a motivation for us. Oh, it's not trivial at all. It's extremely important. Thank you. Right? It is absolutely, it is paramount. That is what makes a clinician a clinician. Where we have the clinical exam, the history and physical and the practice of medicine is where all of that wonderful basic science that we've discovered over the years are then taken into a very practical form. So that's a huge point. Oh yeah, it is. Sure. So yes, not trivial in the least. It's thank actually, you. it's thank huge. Thank you so much. This is what I love about medical school. And uh, I hope by that we just gave you like a, a very brief overview of how students and hopefully like doctors are get made starting from the first few months of, of their career as physicians. So thank you so much Dr. Bazak. Is there anything else would you like to add? Um, it is a long it can be a long journey but it is really just endlessly fascinating and very very rewarding. Thank, thank you. you for honoring me for thank you so to much. be part of your uh, of your video. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you and explaining this stuff. I couldn't explain it in a better way that you did and um, hopefully we'll have future series like that in the future. Please let us guys know if you have any questions in the comments below and hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye.